younger boys have close friends and they, they emotionally confide in each other. And then as those teenage boys get older, they stop doing that. And there's some idea that it's not considered manly to do that. So the boys stop doing it. The girls continue to do it because they've been socialized that it's okay, that it's feminine. It's perfectly reasonable for a girl and a woman to confide in other people, whereas manly men don't do that. And that's, that's one of the stereotypes of the, in the ways that we're raised that hopefully is subsiding, um, that there are more ways to feel like a real boy, a real man, that include emotional engagement with other people. What is the cost of, um, of being lonely? I was reading some studies, I think maybe similar to the ones you described about the gradual decay of connection that's going on in the world. So we're getting lonelier and lonelier as a, as a species. Yes. Um, have you seen that in your studies over the years? You've seen, as you ask these participants, how many people they've got to turn to in that moment of crisis. Are you seeing a decay in the amount of people they think they can call at 2am in the morning? We haven't seen that decay, but there are many other studies that have. And in fact, there's a sociologist named Robert Putnam in at Harvard, actually, who wrote a book in the 80s called Bowling Alone, in which he studied what he called our investment in social capital. Like how much do we join clubs, go to churches and mosques and synagogues? How much do we invite people over to our homes? And what he found was that starting in the 1950s, all of those indices dropped off. We stopped investing in other people. And it seemed to coincide in the US with the introduction of television into the American home. And then he went back in the early 2000s and did the same survey again. All of those parameters had dropped off further. So what he's shown is that we're becoming much more isolated, certainly in the United States, but also in the UK and in the developed world particularly. And it seems to have a lot to do with social mobility. It seems to have a lot to do with digital media and forms of entertainment, many different causes. But the, the net effect is that we are becoming more isolated. And to your question, there's an investigator, Julianne Holt Lundstad, who, who studies loneliness. And what she has estimated is that being lonely is as dangerous to your health as smoking half a pack of cigarettes a day or of being obese. And so what we know is that there are these very real concrete effects of social isolation and loneliness that, that damage us as we go through adult life. I read that there was a, I read in your book that there was a link with Alzheimer's as well. Yes, there is. That the brain declines sooner and the onset of Alzheimer's is earlier in people who are lonely. You're twice as more likely to develop. I believe that that was in the... Um... Marmalade Trust study said you're twice as likely to develop Alzheimer's if you're lonely. It could be. And we think that has to do with stimulation of brain pathways. So the thing that, that makes relationships a little scary and risky because people are unpredictable is also the thing that stimulates our brains. So when I came in here, you and I had never met. Mm -hmm. So I was going to talk to you. I didn't know what you'd be like, right? I didn't know what the questions would be like, but that's good for my brain because you've got my brain running on a lot of different circuits and that's stimulating my brain circuits. That's a good thing. You, I think, are preventing me from becoming demented earlier. <laughs> so thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Are we, are we good at understanding? You know, I think, I think back to that kid, me, sat in that room in Manchester, just absolutely focused on building a business and becoming a CEO and all of those things, the monetary upside. I was particularly bad at, if you'd asked me what the value of a relationship was, I would have, I would have said, I probably would have just pointed to the costs. I would have said, it's gonna go out of time and arguments and- Yeah. In the research that you've done, are people good at understanding the value of a relationship? No, they're not. They're not. Um, partly because relationships are the background. I mean, if you think about it, we've, we've never known the world without relationships. Most of us. Uh, most of us do not live in solitude. And so there have always been people around, which means we tend to take relationships for granted. 
Um, and it's only when you pull back and you look at you know thousands of lives that we saw these powerful effects, the differences between people who had good relationships and people who didn't. Most of us are, you know, it's like that old joke about the the two fish swimming along and the older fish swims by and says, hey boys, how's the water? And one fish turns to the other and says, what's water? And, you know, we're in this swirl of relationships all the time that we take for granted. And so it's, it's particularly difficult for us to understand that this is something that we need to pay attention to, nurture, cultivate throughout life. What if I'm in a toxic relationship? What if my partner is an asshole? Is it, do I stay because of these physiological benefits, insulation from stress or whatever it might be? Um, or do I dump them and go it alone in life? Well, as with so many things, one size does not fit all. There's a huge amount of discernment involved. So if you think about it, one question for a toxic relationship is, how much is at stake? How much do I have invested? So let's say you're married and you have children together. Then the idea is to work really hard to see, is there a way to salvage this relationship? if only for the children, but also because the partnership could have benefits. And so what we, what we would say is if there's a lot invested, then we work harder to see, is there any way we can find ways to work out our differences? Sometimes there isn't, and those relationships need to be ended. But, but I want to point out that most relationships of any consequence have conflict. And so the real issue is not, are there conflicts? The real issue is, can we work out conflicts regularly in ways that make us both feel okay about ourselves and about each other? If we can't do that, then those relationships often need to be stepped away from. When you looked at all, all of the relationships that are beneficial um, and are successful as a relationship, what are the factors that made those relationships most successful, if there are any? One of the things people talk about a lot is being able to be themselves, to be authentic, meaning not to have to hide important aspects of who I am in a relationship. And it's not that we're bearing our souls all the time, but, but do I have to pretend that I'm someone I'm not? That's exhausting and depleting. And so the idea is to be able to be yourself in a relationship of any consequence. Um, I think the other thing we find in good relationships is that people allow each other to change over time. I mean, we're all constantly changing. We're all moving targets. And so if we can allow each other to change and maybe even celebrate that change, the relationship is stable and is likely to last. I mean, I think about, you know, my wife and I are about to celebrate our 37th anniversary. Wow. We are so different than we were 37 years ago. I mean, I I I had never heard of Zen 37 years ago, and now it's a big part of my life. My wife had to figure out what do I do with this guy now who practices Zen. My wife has has developed in ways I never expected. What we've had to do is learn about each other as we change, and 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 accept those changes, and hopefully support each other in changing, which I think mostly my wife and I have been able to do. But it's part of its luck. I mean, it's not like we're such wonderful people. We've just been lucky to be able to support each other in those changes. But part of it is intentional. And, and so I think that the best relationships involve being able to support each other in exploring new things, taking risks. Um, what, one of the things that inhibits all of that is we have these expectations on our partner. We have an expectation oh, yeah. of the role they'll play, of who they'll be, etc how does that impact our chances of being successful in relationships? Yes. I mean, I don't know if you remember this old Billy Joel song, I Love You Just The Way You Are, in which the lyrics are saying, don't ever change. Don't ever, I just want you to be exactly the way you are right now. And that's completely unrealistic. Um, and so we do, we have these expectations of who our partner is going to be. Parents have this of children. I mean, sometimes, sometimes I'll catch myself telling one of my sons who's in his 30s, are you sure you don't want to wear a warmer coat when you're going outside? And he looks at me as his dad. You know, I mean, he, he lives on his own. He's lived on his own for years. It's like, come on. But I have to get out of this mode of being his parent in this, in this 
helicoptering way, right? So we're always having to readjust our expectations of each other in order to make relationships work. If I was your, one of your kids and I said, Dad, give me one piece of relationship advice for how you and Mum have managed to stay together for those 37 odd years. But just I just want one piece of advice, Dad. Catch each other being good. Instead of catching each other at doing the things that annoy you, right? I mean, I'm really good at noticing when my wife does things that annoy me. And I, I'm not good at remembering, oh my gosh, you know, she just made this great meal. Uh, she just made sure that I was on time to this meeting. She just reminded me to take my medication. You know, it's like all these things that, oh my God, if she weren't here, I would be a mess, right? And so what I would say is, it's, it's really practicing gratitude. Gratitude practice is really just flipping, flipping our negatively biased minds on their heads and, and essentially uh, finding what's good, what's going right with the partnership. And when we do that, there's, there's usually so much to find that's, that's not wrong, that's right about the relationship. And if you do that, you, you find that, I find that I'm happier in the relationship, even though there are plenty of times when it's boring, it's predictable, it's annoying, uh, as any re long relationship is, there's so much to be grateful for. The the other thing you talk about a lot in this book is about the use of our time and how we spend our time. Chapter five it kind of goes back to what we were talking about a second ago about time management and discipline and all these things. Um, one of the alarming things I got from chapter five was just how much time we waste unknowingly. And I think maybe this is something that's quite pertinent to your Zen practice. But I think you said that we spend half of our time in waking moments thinking about something other than the thing we're currently doing. Yes. Yes. And it, and that people that do that are more unhappy. So people that spend more time ruminating about, um, or with a wandering mind, as you called it, are the most unhappy. Yes. There's actually good research on this from a different research group where they, they would actually ping people throughout the day at random times and say, are you thinking about what's right in front of you now? Are you thinking about what's current? And that's where they get this uh, data that says, most people will respond, no, I was thinking about something else, the, the future, the past, whatever. And, and then they would also ask at the same time, how's your mood right now? How happy are you? And they found that the people who spent more time thinking about what's right in front of them were far and away happier. Um, so a wandering mind is a less happy mind. In that chapter, you talk about multitasking as well. We all think, I mean, I'm, you know, this is one of the problems I had when I was writing my book as I like to play music yeah, with that has lyrics in it. So yeah. it'll be, I don't know, like <sighs> R&B music or something. Yeah. And I want to write at the same time. And I eventually come to learn that my brain is incapable of doing two things. So it's not actually listening to the music. Um, it can't listen to the music and write at the same time. In chapter five, you talk about this, there's research that shows our brain is not capable of doing one more, more than one thing at a time. That's right. You're, you're really switching back and forth really quickly. And it's super inefficient. It's incredible. It's an incredible waste of energy because your brain takes a moment to get back into gear in the thing you've switched back to. And then it's, and then it's switching off again to something else. And so what we, this idea of multitasking, oh, I can do so many things at once is a fool's errand, basically. Flow state. Mm. Kind of linked to that. Yeah. Is is it a thing? It is a thing. Is it a good thing? Yeah, it is a good thing. Prove so, it. Well, I, I don't know if I can prove it, but, uh, well, actually, there's been some good work by uh, Csikszentmihalyi. He's a, that's his, that's his name, and I can't spell it. It's this uh, long name. He's since passed away, but a very brilliant psychologist who did research on flow states. You know, so I'm a meditator and many people say to me when they find that out, say, oh, I should meditate. And I often say, no, you shouldn't. You should see if meditation feels good to you. And if it does, do it. If it doesn't feel good, find another state, a flow state, if you will. Find another pastime that for you makes the time just fly by. So my wife is not a meditator. She has no interest in it but she loves music and she's a, an avid pianist. 
she can sit for an hour and just be transported playing the piano. That's her flow state. For some people, it's skiing down a ski slope. For some people, it's working in a garden. For some people, it's being on a soccer pitch. It's, you know, um, so what I, my hope for people is that they find a flow state or maybe more than one and that they allow themselves those experiences of flow from time to time where they're just in, so in the activity that time passes by effortlessly without noticing. That's so nice to hear and refreshing for people who have struggled with meditation, which I imagine is most people. Lots of people. And, you know, even on this podcast, when I have guests on, they often talk about the um, positive upside of doing meditative practice. There must be so many people that listen and go, I've tried it, I can't, I can't, it doesn't work for me. But to know that like your hobby, that thing that just, as you said, that makes the time fly by is, is an equally effective potentially form of meditation. Exactly making music or painting or whatever it might be, running. And really trip. nourishing. I mean, it and it gives us energy. It gives us a sense of peace and equanimity to be in that kind of state. If you love the Diary of a CEO brand and you watch this channel, please do me a huge favor, become part of the 15% of the viewers on this channel that have hit the subscribe button. It helps us tremendously. And the bigger the channel gets, the bigger the guests.